Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Fulbright Boot Camp. Today's session, we're going to be going over how to complete a Fulbright application in about five weeks. Uh, just know that today's uh, presentation is really focused on the English Teaching Assistant application, the ETA grant. Um, there will be some information regarding study research, but very little. So um, just so you know, as we go into this presentation, really the first half will be focused on the Fulbright program in general, the application timeline, what to expect from the application components. And then we'll go into next steps um, and some actionable items that you can get started on right away if you decide to apply for this cycle. So we're very excited to have you here today. My name is Katie Salgado. Um, I'm the program manager for ANZA and I work with Fulbright ETA. So um, you'll be able to get to know myself if you apply and the rest of our office as well. So maybe you've heard of our office before, uh, maybe since you know the beginning of your time at ASU or maybe you just heard of us the last week when you received an email from us. We do everything from start to finish regarding national scholarships. So starting with publicizing these major awards all the way to the end, helping you with your essays, strategizing recommenders, advising applicants, and just generally supporting your personal, professional, and academic growth. But our office is just national scholarships, so we're not anything related to internal ASU scholarships. All of the programs that we run are characterized by their funding source, which is largely outside of ASU, uh, typically government agencies, nonprofits, or a combination. But many of these programs have specific missions. They're open to undergrads, graduate students, or alumni. I think that's a common misconception about our office is that you have to be an undergraduate to apply. We actually work with alumni, ASU alumni, all the time, uh, and graduate students as well. So we're really excited to work with you on not only um, applications in general for these nationally funded scholarships, but the Fulbright program as well. Now the Fulbright program is one of our largest programs that we work with, and it was created in 1946 by Congress right after the Second World War. And really its mission is to foster mutual understanding between nations. So there's um, about 140 countries that are part of the Fulbright program. Um, and as part of your application, you can only apply to one program and one country per cycle. Um, but it's a really amazing binational uh, you know, agreement. It's really one of our greatest peacekeeping, um, peacekeeping programs and diplomacy programs because it's really encouraging students to um, go out there and you know, interact in the global community in a way that is authentic to them and using their skills and abilities and talents. And ASU is a top producer for Fulbright grants. We'll get anywhere between 50 and 90 applicants per year and anywhere from 15 to 30 winners per year as well. Um, and ASU students do so well in, you know, with their Fulbright applications because of the activities and the extracurriculars and the engagement that you all do, um, not only in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom, which is really what Fulbright is looking for. They're looking for well-rounded students. To be eligible for Fulbright, you have to be a graduating senior. So the earliest you can apply is as a rising senior, um, meaning that if you're sitting down right now listening to this, uh, this presentation, then you would be planning on graduating in May of 2022, okay? Um, if you're early to the game and, and you're still, you're a rising junior, for example, we encourage you, you you're so welcome to stay um, and listen to this presentation. We have a number of workshops in the spring. So you're welcome to come back to our office in spring 2022 and uh, get started on some of the writing process and early bird stuff. So just know that we do a lot of things in the spring as well, so you can get an early start um, if that's where you're at. But Fulbright is also open to research, recent graduates, graduate students, and early career professionals. Um, there's not a ton of eligibility other than you have to be a US citizen at the time of the application. You have to have a complete bachelor's degree by the start of your grants, meaning, so that's why um, ideally if you receive the award and you begin fall of 2022, you will have graduated by May 2022. 
Uh, you just can't have a PhD at the time of the application. So, so long as you are, do not have a conferred PhD degree um, and you're you know, a rising senior or above, you would be eligible. The award covers round trip airfare, monthly stipend, accident sickness insurance, and there are a few other possible benefits like tuition support and language training uh, that may be offered to you throughout your grant. Again, it just depends on the host country, but it's enough to live a comfortable student lifestyle. And there's over you know, 1,200 awards for ETA that are offered each year. All of the grants will last between eight to 10 months, so typically an academic year. And there are about 75 countries to choose from, which is really, really lovely. Um, but like I said before, you can only choose one country. So part of the process, especially the getting started process, is choosing which one you want to go to. The criteria for ETA is again, very broad. They're looking for students with excellent verbal and written communication skills. Flexibility, adaptability, and openness are quite frankly, the three pillars of Fulbright. So they're really looking for students who are open to uh, an international experience um, and they don't require foreign language proficiency. Certain, there are many countries that don't, but um, if you do have previous language training, that may be uh, beneficial for your application as well. And for cohesive teaching philosophy, you know, they don't expect you to be a professional teacher necessarily, or even want to be a professional teacher long term. But what they're looking for is someone with transferable skills. Maybe you have tutored, maybe you have coached, you know, there's a there's so many things um, and skills that you can transfer into the English learning classroom that can be beneficial, right? And so when they say cohesive teaching philosophy, they're really think they're really talking about have you thought through how you might teach and how you might execute and what are your what are your um, opinions on what's the best way to learn a language and what topics would you cover all of all of these things they want to see in your essays there's some common misconceptions about Fulbright as well one is that you need to be a world traveler or the opposite that you you can't be a world traveler we've gotten both of these Actually, Fulbright does not discriminate either way. We've had students who have never left the United States receive Fulbrights and students who have um, you know, lived abroad or done study abroad and they have both received awards. Um, some students worry, you know, maybe you did do a study abroad. Let's say you did a semester in Spain or a summer in Spain. They say, oh, well, I can't go back to Spain. Um, that's not necessarily true. They just don't want long-term um, over five years, long-term time in the host country. Um, but for, for the most part, if you have studied abroad um, for you know, the most in academic year, then you should be fine. There's also no minimum GPA for Fulbright. So a lot of students self-select out because they think they need to have a 4.0 or 4.5. Um, nope, not the case. We've had students from a range of GPAs all receive Fulbrights. Um, and that's that's what Fulbright is about, right? They're they're not looking for someone with just one expertise in one thing, right? Not they're not just looking for people with good grades. They're looking for well-rounded students who can have these dialogues with with you know in an international classroom and be flexible and make the most of their grant experience. So they really do look at your application holistically, and you don't need to be planning to be a teacher or have a TESOL certification to be an ETA. We get lots of students who in their application say, you know, I'm planning on going to med school or law school later on, or I wanna be a full-time journalist afterwards. And um, that's totally fine. I, that actually strengthens their application because they have a strong idea of what they want to do after the grant. But they also talk about the ways in which the ETA grants will help them prepare for that long-term plan and ways in which they can use their background in science or art or journalism to, to have a successful ETA grant. The ideal ETA applicants will convey enthusiasm. I think that's really a, a defining theme across ETAs, regardless of their discipline, regardless of their background. They're excited to teach and be a part of this cultural exchange. Um, and they use the most of their talents and skills. I think 
um, again, you are not pigeonholed by your, your major or your discipline. It's really about proposing a, com a compelling project and um, selling yourself as to why an ETA makes sense for you at this time. So since you are an English teaching assistant, you'll be teaching about 20, 30 hours a week as part of your grant, but they also ask that you plan a supplementary project. Um, now they understand since you don't know where you're going to be placed exactly, you don't know the school or the city at the time of the application, it should be a project that is flexible and that is specific to your uh, skills and talents, really. It should be something that's outside of teaching hours and students have done a variety of projects ranging from community service, independent study, language study. Um, and, you know, I've had students who love knitting and have gone to artisanal fairs and taught their student, students how to knit or students who have um, coached sports like soccer and started a soccer team with their students or in the community. It's really, really cool. Um, but it has to support cross-cultural exchange in some way. And that's something that when you apply to Fulbright and you work with an ONS advisor, a lot of the process is also just um, talking through, um, you know, your ideas for not only teaching in the classroom, but outside of the classroom. All, applica all applicants need these three things, the basic personal data, the two essays, both of which are one page long, and the three references. So for the essays, it's pretty straightforward. We have a one page personal statement, which is you know, a personal narrative um, covering your, your personal motivations for why you want to apply to Fulbright. Anything you want the, um, the host country or the national screening committee to know about you and your motivations. And then the statement of grant purpose is more more geared towards your future career and your teaching ideas um, and telling us more of the professional aspirations that you have. And depending on the country that you apply to, you might need a foreign language evaluation, but that all depends on your country. Some do not require any, or they recommend a foreign language evaluation, but it's not required. But regardless of this, all materials must be submitted online via the Fulbright online application by September 13th at midnight Mountain Standard Time. So this is the breakdown of the timeline that's, that's coming up. So September 13th is our ASU deadline. And the reason why we have this earlier deadline is not to make your life harder. We promise it's not to make your life harder. It's actually for your benefit because we set up virtual interviews for you on September 24th. Everyone is being interviewed at the same time. Um, ASU, creates a campus committee for you based off of the region that you apply to. So for example, if you are applying to an ETA in South Korea, um, you'll submit your application on September 13th. You'll come in, you'll have a virtual interview on September 24th and you will interview with about three or four faculty and staff who are experts in teaching South Korea, uh, maybe Fulbright alumni or a combination of the three and they'll sit down and they'll look at the application that you submitted on September 13th and give you feedback, which is really, really great. So these virtual interviews are about 30 minutes long. The first 15 minutes are focused on um, asking you questions about why you're applying, um, pretty basic things like anything that you mentioned in your application, the committee might ask you to expand upon that, ask about your ideas for the classroom, um, you know, might give you a few what if scenarios and, you know, ask you what you would do in, in certain situations. Um, and then the, the next 15 minutes is all feedback. Um, and so they'll talk through your application with you. This is an opportunity for also you to engage with them and ask them specific questions about what they thought about specific parts of your application. So we always encourage students to have a hard copy of their essays. Um, to take notes, to be really actively engaged. For these virtual interviews, the benefit of them is that your committee is interviewing you so that they can endorse you on behalf of ASU, okay? So the endorsement is a boost to your application. We write an additional letter of endorsement that goes into your application. You, will, you won't see it, but it goes in your application and it gives you an extra boost because 
Um, many of the Fulbright countries do not do interviews. There's some that do, um, but by and large, many ETA countries do not do any sort of interview um, after you submit your application. So this might be the only interview you get, and it's by people who want to see you succeed, right? ASU wants to endorse you. We don't have any cap about how many people we can endorse. Um, so we want to support you. We want to endorse you. The only reason why we wouldn't endorse someone is if they submit an incomplete application or if there's um, a, a larger concern at hand about um, being able to, to complete an ETA grant. Um, but by and large, these virtual interviews, it's not an exam. There's no right or wrong answers. They're really just trying to gauge your motivations for the Fulbright so that they can write you an, a fantastic letter of endorsement. Okay, and then after the virtual interviews, the nice part is, is that you can go back into your application and make changes, right? You can implement the feedback if you want from your committee, you can meet with OMS advisors, you can uh, attend our workshops, peer review, and then make all of the changes that you want. And then we suggest that you resubmit your final application by October 8th, just so you have a nice cushion. Uh, you definitely don't wanna leave it till the day of for the national deadline, just because of time zone differences, you know, technical difficulties, we've seen it all. Um, but nevertheless, you'll have a good two weeks after your virtual interviews to make changes to your application. So that's also why ASU, do, ASU students do so well is because uh, you all take the time, you get that preliminary application in for the ASU deadline, you get extra feedback from experts um, and you submit a fantastic application for the national deadline. So we're nearing towards the end of part one of this presentation, just going over when you should apply to Fulbright. Um, just remember you have to have a bachelor's degree by the start of your grant. Um, so if you are a December grad, you might be able to apply to a few countries because um, there are a few that start in January and March that do the calendar year. So just know that that is an option for you as well. You will not know where you will be placed before you apply as an ETA, but also that's there's a reason for that because Fulbright commissions work hard to place you in a school that aligns with your skill set and background. The living situation really depends on your host country. Most candidate profiles will state the housing arrangements. The three most common options are homestays, student housing, and apartments. But just know that the commission is there to help you as soon as you land. They always do a pre, a, you know, an orientation. They set up your bank account. They help you find a cell phone and a SIM card, um, and your living situation. They don't just say, "Hey, go find housing in this in this new country where you may or may not know the language." Right? Um, they'll give you everything you need in order to live a comfortable student lifestyle. And then you can bring pets, family, or friends. Mm, it depends on the country, right? Um, especially with the pets part. Um, you'll probably want to check with the actual country's quarantine restrictions. That's a big thing. Friends cannot be part of your stipend, but certain countries do have family um, and dependent support. But um, at the bottom of the candidate profiles of the countries, you will find links to the designated representative of the host country, and you are welcome to reach out to them um, and double check because that's if that's an important part of whether or not you will apply, um, you should absolutely you know, figure that out beforehand. Submitting your application for the September 13th campus deadline will be done via the Fulbright online application portal, okay? It's for the campus deadline and the national deadline. Same portal, same application. It will go um, to our office this first, in, in the first time that you submit. But your application will be available for revision after the campus deadline, which is always good to know. Okay, so we've reached part two of this. So um, about here, you'll be deciding, okay, is Fulbright right for me? Am I eligible? Does this work within my timeline? If you are ready to take that next step, we really want you to commit to the process, okay? We, we really value professionalism. You know, we respond to email promptly. You have to update us. We understand there are certain things outside of your control, right? If you are asking for letters of recommendation, for example, 
Um, and you have a recommender who's maybe being non-responsive or something happens, they had a family emergency and they can't submit by the September 13th deadline. You need to be updating us on all of these things, right? Um, you know, ghosting us doesn't do anyone any good. Um, I think that even if you decide not to apply, you start the process and decide not to, you need to communicate with us where you are in this application because we are managing upwards to 90 apps. We're working with 90 students um, with two essays each. So you do the math, that's a lot of essays. We're all busy. So just know also that last minute work receives last minute attention. You know, if you're sending us drafts 12 hours before the campus deadline, quite frankly, it likely will not receive um, feedback at that time because we're already switching into phase two, which is getting your campus committee figured out, okay? So we really want you to make the most of the resources and make the most of our advisors as soon as possible. So the Fulbright advisors, if you're applying to ETA, you will likely work with myself, Ms. Catherine Salgado, you can call me Katie, but we also have Dr. Lori Stoff, and Dr. Neela Bhattacharya, who are faculty advisors who advise on ETA as well. Dr. Kyle Mox is the director of our office, but he works primarily with study research awards. Um, so you might see a, an email from him or two, just make sure you read it. But by and large, you'll be working with us three, uh, Dr. Staff, Dr. Bhattacharya, and myself for ETA feedback. And then we also have Ms. Laura Sells as our general application guidance. Um, you'll work with her maybe a little bit, but Mr. Josh Brooks is also program manager for graduate fellowships, so you'll probably interact with them a little bit less, um, but just know that this is our team. We're here to help you and support you, and we're excited to get to know you. So the first step that you need to do is to choose your country. Really, that is the first domino to fall um, in order to get started, okay? Obviously, if you're here, you're probably leaning towards ETA, and so that's already um, a big win. Once you do that, you can go ahead and open up a Fulbright application and list ASU as your institution. That's also very important because that lets our office know that you intend to apply through ASU. And you can meet with an ONSA advisor at any time. Sooner is better rather than later. Um, and you need to get added to the Canvas page. Our Canvas page is full of resources. We have example essays, we have um, webinars, we have all sorts of things to answer your questions about the application, but you cannot get added to the Canvas page until you meet with an ONSA advisor. You need to meet and have an intake appointment and, and talk through your application and your country choice with an advisor before you get added to this page. And then, you know, once you know that you, you know your country, you know you're applying through ASU, you can start asking your recommenders and add them to your Fulbright online application. All of the recommendations that, that go through the, the portal, um, you, have to add your, you have to add your recommenders to your application and they'll receive uh, a third party link in which they upload their answers, okay? Um, same thing with the foreign language evaluation. It's all done through the Fulbright portal. And then begin drafting your essays. You can start with the SOGP. There's examples and advice on Canvas. Um, you know, everyone has different working styles. I think you need to, you know, you need to have enough time to receive at least three rounds of review per essay. Okay, so three revisions of the PS and three revisions of the statement of grant purpose. You cannot just throw words on a paper and submit that for your campus interview, okay? That's not gonna lead to a very productive interview because they won't be able to give very specific feedback, quite frankly. Um, and it's, it's harder to endorse you if the materials aren't, uh, you know, haven't gone through a few revisions, that if the writing's not clear, if your, um, your reasons for applying are not clear. So that's why we say, okay, this needs to get started really fast. Choose your country, start, start asking for your recommenders um, because truly you need to give your recommenders enough time to also write, <laughs> write um, their recommendations, fill out the forms, anything late, like less than two weeks, you know, is really borderline. That's, I mean, even if it's someone, a uh, professor who really likes you and you know well, please give them more than two weeks. Ideally, you need to give them 
four weeks in order to, you know, make sure that you're doing everything in a professional manner. So um, that's why we're really on crunch time. <laughs> you know, as of today, August 13th, um, we're starting to loom in on week four of the countdown. And so that's why we're really trying to get you started. So choosing a country, some major considerations. Look at the candidate profile. They'll state, um, you know, what age group you would potentially be placed in. Um, they might even say if the placements tend to be rural or urban. And if you have previous language proficiency, that might be helpful, but that doesn't mean that you have to choose a particular country just because you have that training. Just know that most of Central America and South America do have stated preference for TESOL and education majors, um, and they require advanced Spanish. So the reason being is that their placements tend to be in teacher training colleges. So you're not actually teaching other students, you would be teaching other teachers. And so they do require, you know, a higher level of training and background for both foreign language and then also um, TESOL and education. Um, but there's, you know, so many countries out there. Um, the most competitive tend to be the most popular in study abroad, which are Greece, Spain, Italy, and France. So I strongly recommend that you avoid those countries if you can and really look into countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Eastern Europe, and new programs. Um, there are lots of countries, especially if you're just open to anywhere, there are lots of countries that have much higher selection rates. Um, and they're really looking for just well-rounded, open, flexible individuals. I mean, they'll say that in their candidate profile, but that's truly, they're not, um, because their placements are also very open, they're trying to gain more applications. Um, and that's, you know, great. It's a win-win for both parties. One of the best things that you can do is use the award search on the Fulbright program. You can um, see the English teaching assistant, you can narrow it down by award type, the language proficiency, the placement type, um, and it's really great. You can also see the start date, um, which is, you know, if you're a December grad, this is going to be really important about the timeline. Um, so just you look through this. This is also it's like a quick hits guide, basically, for finding potential countries and narrowing it down. Some favorable ETA options in Asia. Uh, Central Asia has selection rates of, you know, 40 percent and above. I mean, that's really, really amazing. And there's no language requirement. Um, if you're the adventurous type, definitely worth your consideration. A lot of places in Southeast Asia not required, although many ETAs end up learning the local language and, and participating in things just because it is a, an essential part of the exchange, um, but it's not required in order to apply. So um, just keep in mind, keep an open mind about all of these things. In Europe, same thing, Eastern Europe tends to be undersubscribed, uh, undersubscribed to. Um, they have a few more language requirements. For example, Spain is requires intermediate Spanish rather than advanced. So if you are at an intermediate Spanish level, that's about four semesters of college, um, college level Spanish, then Spain might be in the cards for you. Um, but if you're open to any place, then you might also consider Bulgaria or Macedonia or any of the um, Eastern Europe countries. The Canvas, this is just a, a quick preview. We have these um, modules down below, really fantastic resources. Again, nothing is submitted through Canvas. This is just a resource page, but it's a great way. We also do all of our announcements through Canvas, so you get reminders. When we post our workshops, we'll have our calendar up there. It's, it's really a great place, but you can't get on the Canvas until you open up an app commit to the process, meet with an advisor, and then we'll, we'll add you to there. Okay, so I do want to um, go over the reference form question. So like I said, the ETA form, it, it's a form. You, you have three recommenders who answer the same five questions. They're not writing narrative letters of recommendation for you. So the first question is, based on your observation of and the experience with the applicant, comments on their ability to overcome challenges, 
In your view, how has the applicant demonstrated qualities associated with teaching or mentoring? Based on your observation, how might the applicant interact with students, faculty, and community members, among others, or in a different cultural environment? What kind of impression in your view would the applicant make as a representative of the US abroad? And then please comment on any other factors which may have a bearing on the applicant's potential to have a successful uh, opportunity as a Fulbright ETA, okay? So these are pretty straightforward questions. Um, your recommenders get a little less than a paragraph to answer them. They do have a word limit on them, but all of these questions are geared um, towards the Fulbright mission. So that's really what we're looking for here. Um, so feel free, you can pause it here and read through the, the questions and um, also just consider who could best answer these. They don't have to be all professors. They don't have to be all academic. Usually if you have at least one academic reference that can be helpful, but by and large, the most helpful uh, letters of recommendation for the ETA form will be people who have actually seen you in action. Maybe it's a supervisor, maybe someone who's trained you. Um, in terms of who should write your letter of recommendation, it, you know they can't be working professionals, faculty, staff, anything along those lines. Um, we just ask that you avoid any sort of family friends. You should not have peers, anyone uh, like of your status or age be writing this, this recommendation. And if you have any issues or concerns, that's a conversation to have with your advisor as well. We're happy to kind of brainstorm with you who might be the best three people to write these references. And if you have a quick question, you can refer to Canvas. Be prepared for advising appointments. That's really, really important, guys. If you're looking for draft review, send the drafts at least 24 hours beforehand in an email, um, attach it as a Word document. That's really the best way for us to add comments and, and screen share with you and do all of that. Um, if it's your intake meeting, be sure to send us a copy of your resume and unofficial transcript so we can review those beforehand and see what you're involved in and ask you questions um, and seek those references and evaluations immediately. I mean, truly, I know choosing a country is hard and maybe you're between one or two countries and you can talk through that with your advisor as well, but as soon as you get that narrowed down, you should be asking for, for references. So the country is really a, you know, one of the harder things to, to pick. And I think that that's always the first domino to fall. So make sure to look at the list of countries that offer ETA awards, narrow down the countries that interest you. Um, look carefully at the candidate profile, right? If they say we prefer master's level students and you're not quite yet at that level, then maybe um, put it on the back burner and um, move on to another country that fits you know, your qualifications better. And then the selection rates, take that with a grain of salt as well. References, um, they should be able to comment on your leadership teaching and or ambassadorial skills, mentors, professors, supervisors, um, and we'll provide more information on this, but they should not be close family, friends, neighbors, any of anything along those lines, because we want them to be as credible as possible. Um, those who are reading these references are also, you know, professors, established people in their fields. And so we want to make sure that your references are credible and that they can take it seriously. A lot of students ask when they'll be done, thinking that after the third draft, they will be done. You will be done when you submit for the national deadline, but you should be constantly revising and reworking your essays up until the national deadline in October. And there are uh, some short answer questions at the beginning of the application. When you open it up, you'll, you'll notice it, but we call them the abstracts. But honestly, these answers depend on what you write in your essay. So just know that by and large, you should be focused on getting your references and start drafting your essays, choosing your country. Those are the three main thing, things that you want to get started on right away in order to submit a strong application for the campus deadline. And we do have some essay workshops scheduled. Right now we have a few in person, just know that those are also subjects to go hybrid or go online um, as we move into the fall semester. 
Um, but we do have two virtual ones that are already planned for September 3rd and 10th. So we'll just keep you posted. Everything um, will be posted on Canvas, any updates. Um, so just know that we offer so many resources for you all to succeed, but you truly get out of this process what you put in. So as part of it, not only just knowing, okay, um, how much time do I have to dedicate to writing these essays? I think um, in terms of the actual time it takes to complete a Fulbright application, I would equate it to about a graduate school app in terms of you know the time that you need to, the thoughtfulness that you need to put into it um, and the time it requires to get those references in. So it's not impossible, but it does require you know your priority um, and you need to decide if you, you truly want to apply this cycle. And the other thing is, is that we work with alumni, right? So if you're a rising senior right now, you could apply next year if that's part of your plan. Um, but just know that you are applying to, to go on your grants potentially um, the next fall, right? So it is a, a longer process. If you decide to wait a year, it will be two years until you potentially could go on this grant. Um, so that's also why a lot of students say, you know what, I'm willing to prioritize this and throw my hat in the ring and go for it rather than uh, wait because, you know, I'm trying to explore my options and I think I can do this. So I think that's um, either way, we're here to support you and we're excited to work with you. You can access all of this information on our Fulbright uh, tab on our website. So fulbright.asu.edu is a great place to start. You can look through the country profiles via the Fulbright US student site. You can also look at the workshop schedule on our uh, ONSA website under info sessions, and you can make an appointment with our advisors at vast.barrett.asu.edu. Thanks so much for attending today's session. If you have any questions, feel free. You can email me at katherine.solgato at asu.edu. Um, I'm happy to answer your email. And um, just let us know if you have any questions or concerns. But other than that, we look forward to working with you should you apply to Fulbright this cycle. Thanks, guys. <laughs>